biggest city, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. Paul Wells is a columnist, a laugh out loud funny columnist who I used to read a lot in the pages of the Post, and now he graces the back page of McLean's magazine. And David Asper, who once trained as a lawyer and a businessman, is now pretty well in charge of the entire content side of Can West Global, the newspapers, the television, the radio, an awesome instrument, a great creative challenge. So we're going to begin with Paul. Thank you so much. Can we uh, cue my soundtrack, please? This is going to play all the way through, so if I'm boring, you get some good tunes anyway. This music in the background is the middle movement of Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 132. Um, he wrote it. It was one of the last five pieces of music he ever wrote. He was past 50. He was deaf. He could only communicate with people by pointing to symbols in a special book that he carried around. And it's funny that he would write a string quartet because he was a very accomplished piano player, very mediocre violinist, which is why might explain why he wrote five uh, piano concertos and only one violin uh, concerto, because he really couldn't play the fiddle. But it doesn't matter, because by the end of his life, he was living in a world of essentially pure imagination. He, all he could hear was the sound in his own head. And when you listen to his late quartets, what you hear is a kind of a music of pure imagination, divorced from theory or anyone's idea of proper structure. This particular tune is called the Heiliger Dankgesang, the holy song of thanksgiving in the Lydian mode from a convalescent to the divinity. I chose this version particularly um, because it's my favorite of the few versions that I've checked out in the last few weeks. Uh, it's by an American quartet called the Emerson String Quartet. And it's handy for my present purposes because it is 17 minutes and 41 seconds long. <laughs> which, mean, which means that when the Emersons are done, I'm going to have two minutes to wrap up. And I wanted to demonstrate with a long piece of beauty what you can do with 20 minutes. Because if I was just me speaking, I wouldn't, there would be no demonstration of, of, of beauty, although the, you'd, you'd have a punishing sentiment of length. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking for a long time what, how much I can get done with 20 minutes. And I decided that I would um, use Beethoven, who's moved in the second part of the, of, of the tune, as a demonstration. Um, Beethoven stands as an example that, uh, that, that, that if, you, if you work really hard, you can, you, can, you can get a lot done with 20 minutes. And those of us who work in the cultural industries, in the arts, uh, in, in, uh, and in the news business, need to keep that in mind all the time. We had better get a lot done with 20 minutes because the market value of a fixed length of time has been exploding over the last several years. Let me explain what I mean. In 1997, two American uh, economists named Michael Cox and Richard Alm wrote uh, a, a, an article that was widely uh, discussed at the time. What they demonstrated is that because of rises in working wages and industrial innovation, the cost of almost every staple of life has been collapsing over the course of the 20th century. If I had taken these 20 minutes in 1919 and, and, and devoted them to labor at an average wage so that I could buy some eggs, at the end of those 20 minutes, I would have been able to buy three eggs. But by the late 1990s, 20 minutes labor would have allowed the average worker to buy four dozen eggs. If I wanted to buy some milk, in 1919, 20 minutes work would have gotten me a quarter gallon of milk. In the late 1990s, 20 minutes work would have bought me a gallon and a half, a six-fold increase. Say I wanted to buy some chicken. 20 minutes work, 1919, six ounces of chicken. In 1997, four and a half pounds. Remember when Herbert Hoover promised a chicken in every pot? It's because back then that seemed like just an incredible extravagance. Now it just seems automatic. Um, say in about 1950 you had wanted to fly from New York to Los Angeles to see the Emerson String Quartet play the Beethoven 132 Concerto. You would have had to uh, work about two weeks to be able to afford that ticket. Today you can buy that ticket after 16 hours of, of labor. 
the mathematically inclined will notice that what I'm doing is setting up a fraction. Number of hours you got to work to buy some stuff. If the denominator is getting smaller, if you can buy, if, if, if the market value of the stuff we need to get through our lives has been collapsing, that, that's the same as the numerator getting bigger. The value of your time is exploding. This is causing a permanent secular crisis in the life of anyone whose job depends on asking for your time, which means time is money. It is worth more money today than it ever has been, which means that audiences are never again going to tolerate having their time wasted. Who is this causing trouble for? It's causing trouble for movie studios, movie theaters, live theater, live music, recorded music, and the news business. There are two ways to react to this crisis. You can surrender. You can, you, can, you can live in a world of secular decline. You can acknowledge that your audience is always going to be busier and therefore you're always going to have a smaller audience. Or you can engage and you can fight back and you become um, what I actually thought five minutes ago I will, I, I've decided I will call a warrior for lost time. I first started thinking about this about 10 years ago when I was in uh, Montreal watching jazz club after jazz club close. And it started to bug me because I'm a jazz fan and I was wondering why is it that uh, people aren't going to jazz clubs anymore? And I realized it's because jazz clubs and jazz musicians are doing everything they can to drive audiences away. If you go to a typical jazz club, or especially a typical failing jazz club, um, <laughs> there is no uh, piece of paper to tell you who's going to be playing there next week. There's no piece of paper there to identify who's playing tonight. The musicians come on stage a half hour late. They're dressed worse than I'm dressed right now. They barely know each other. They haven't rehearsed. Uh, they call tunes. The, 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 the trick of, of jazz is that you can improvise with strangers, and therefore they all do. And so they, <laughs> <laughs> and so they spend 10 minutes calling a tune. I don't know, do you want to play uh, How High the Moon? Uh, what key? And they, and they, you know, and then, and, 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 and the thing is, that, what, what, I, what I realize that they don't realize is that this is the only time in the year that most of the audience is coming out to a jazz club. And they're expecting it to be a great moment. They're expecting it to be a, to be a revelation. And if we can cue the video, um, we'll see what they, what they actually thought they were going to hear. This is the Duke Ellington Orchestra in 1930, <laughs> playing a little tune called Rug Cutter. This is the greatest orchestra on earth in 1930, and it would be again today if it was still there. Look at these guys. <laughs> They're all in their white tuxedos, right? Sonny Greer back there has, has chosen his drums because they look good. <laughs> Clarinet players like this, you know? The guys in the horn section get up and sing, I want to be a rug cutter. You know? And then bam, here comes Ivy Anderson. She's going to sing for you. Now, jazz musicians today, here's, here's Duke, and he's having a good time. Jazz musicians today will tell you that this is all hokey old guy stuff, and, that, and, 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 and they were selling out, they were Uncle Tomming, they were doing, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were doing this because they didn't take their music and their art seriously enough. To which I would have to respond, okay, well, you can dress down and slum and, 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 and not rehearse and stuff. If you can play better, than Harry Carney on the baritone saxophone, who was the greatest baritone saxophonist there ever was, and it doesn't matter whether he was in a white tux or a plastic bag, he just played his horn better. <laughs> I mean, look at these guys. Here comes Johnny Hodges. Boy, if you can play your saxophone better than Johnny Hodges, you can wear what you want. But otherwise, you have to prepare for your 20 minutes. <laughs> I think I might have made my point. We'll turn that, we'll turn that off. <laughs> Jazz clubs close when people go into a jazz club expecting that and they get what we get every night of the week in Montreal. It's obvious to me. So that's what surrender is. Surrender is when you don't bother to recreate what Duke Ellington created to, be, to make jazz what it is today. 
in the late 1980s, the newspaper business was essentially a, a, a running battle to produce a product that looked as much as possible like a television. What's engagement? Engagement is, what, is, the, is the strategy that has been chosen by almost the entire museum sector in the last couple of years. It's why um, some of the best architecture in the world is in museums and art galleries and concert halls. Why, got, why I know, know the names of guys like Frank Gehry and Daniel Liebeskin, because they are uh, building temples to culture that refuse to waste your time. Um, it is why the Seattle Central Library is one of the most talked about architectural monuments uh, of the last few years. Seattle Central a Library opened last, um, last month, and it is built in a spiral that goes up the equivalent of five stories so that the books don't suddenly stop at, you know, 0.637 on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the little system to find the Dewey Decimal, and then suddenly you've got to go somewhere else because that's two minutes out of your life that you'll never have again to find the books. So they have the books in a spiral. And, 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 and the whole library is, is designed to not waste your time. And as a matter of fact, to provide a rich experience. We are actually in the geographic middle of one of North America's uh, multiplayer battles for lost time. We are in a cultural center of Toronto that is being reborn. The Art Gallery of Ontario, Frank Gehry. The Royal Ontario Museum, Daniel Liebeskin. The new Opera House, finally, after generations of wishing for an opera house in this country. The um, University of Toronto Music Building, which is, which is being reborn. And one of the generals in this battle for lost time is a fellow named Bill Thorsell. Bill Thorsell used to be, edit used to be an editorialist for the Globe and Mail. And uh, in 1990, through the sort of skullduggery that often prevails in my line of work, he became the editor of the Globe. And um, <laughs> he realized back then, as pertains to newspapers, what he has realized recently as pertains to uh, museums. He, he's struggling to tear away enough of your time so that you will look at his product so that you will also see an ad and then you'll buy the product and he'll make some money and he'll have, he'll, 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 he'll have a, uh, a job next, next year. But he was incredibly devious in the way he did it. He decided that the way to get you to look at his product was to give you a product worth looking at. In the late 1980s, the newspaper business was essentially a, a, a running battle to produce a product that looked as much as possible like a television. It was the post-USA Today uh, period in newspaper des design. Um, and the idea was that it was essentially a strategy based on surrender. The reader's not going to give more than a few minutes a day to the newspaper. So we're going to cut everything down real short. We're going to package it really brightly in boxes so that it looks like you're looking at it on TV. We're going to have a lot of pictures and a lot of graphs. And the five minutes of a day, you'll feel like you've gotten something useful out of it. Thorsell said, screw that. I'm going to make the simplest design I can so that, a so that you won't have a hard time finding the end of a long story. I'll hire the best writers. I'll give them the time. I'll give them the travel budgets. I'll give them the research uh, assistance that they need so that the, the newspaper isn't worth only five minutes, it's worth 20 minutes, or an hour, or an hour and a half. This cost a pot of money, but circulation skyrocketed. The Globe and Mail became one of the most influential papers in North America, and only when the National Post came along uh, in 1998 did anyone uh, show that they were able to do it even better. I'm biased. <laughs> There is example after example in my business of uh, a case where someone has chosen a strategy of engagement with the battle for time instead of surrender, and won. Tina Brown used to be the editor of The New Yorker. And uh, she made it kind of glitzy and fun and hip and now. And she scored some victories. But having Roseanne Barr edit a, 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 an issue of The New Yorker or having um, uh, you know, fo photos of fashion models and stuff like that actually didn't make the New Yorker make a lot of money. And then she went off to pursue a new adventure and she was um, replaced by a boring former Moscow correspondent named David Remnick, 
uh, really not an exciting fellow at all. But he understood more profoundly than she had that what you need is not an exciting experience or not a fun, a, a fun experience or something. You need a rich experience when you pick up a magazine or you won't pick it up. And so he hired investigative reporters, Cy uh, um, Hirsch, who broke the Abu Ghraib Iraq torture stories, because he had two years to poke around until he found uh, those stories. Uh, he hired calmer, less flamboyant writers, but also more, more um, uh, uh, better researchers. The upshot is that in the five years that uh, Dave Remnick has been um, editing The New Yorker, circulation is up and profits are up 25%. The Emersons are done, which means I'm almost done. I, I can't save the world, and I'm glad that other people are trying. All I know is that if I didn't give you something interesting to think about with your 20 minutes, some of you would already have left. And I did what I could with these 20 minutes, and those of us who work in the arts and culture and in the news business need to fight for every 20 minutes we can get, because our, our livelihood depends on it. Thanks very much. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.